about the idea. Ty's going to kill himself getting on the stage. <laughs> He's okay. That's good. Uh, we're going to be talking today about God inviting us into a relationship with Him, and, and then God using that relationship, and out of that relationship, putting us into His service. Uh, we're going to be talking about Moses, and you know, as I was thinking about this passage, one of the things that really kind of kind of jumped out to me was reminding myself of one of the things that I look forward to in moving back here to Sanger. One of the things that I look forward to was getting to do some things with my dad that I had done when I was younger. And I have a picture that's going to come up here. Uh, I will just tell you this. I could not find, I felt bad because daddy, I could not find a picture of you and I on horses working cows. <laughs> Um, I don't know where we have those. Uh, I looked around. I couldn't find one. But, you know, I used to, I loved. Uh, my dad and I would go. Uh, we'd go out. We'd ride horses. We'd work cows together. You know, I was thinking about coming back here. One of the things that I was looking forward to was getting the opportunity to, to be out with my dad and to work cows with my dad and to do some things with my dad that, that I had enjoyed, mostly enjoyed growing up. And also the opportunity to have my son, Zach, be able to be with his pa and to do those things and, and to work out. You know, and I will tell you, uh, there's been some times where dad's called me and, and I've had to go out there and I wasn't all that excited about going out there a few times and I had to repent of those things. But there have been some times where I really have enjoyed it. And I will tell you this, I don't want to make fun of my dad for a minute. Either my dad's temper has gotten a whole lot better since I was gone for those 20 plus years, or he feels bad getting mad and saying bad words in front of his pastor. <laughs> or he just doesn't want his grandson to hear him saying uh, some words like that. I'm not sure exactly which one of those it is. But, you know, it is, it is exciting. It's, it's fun. <laughs> it, it is fun to be able to, to go out there and to do those things with my dad. And, yes... Working the cows with my dad, it's hard work a lot of times, and, and you get dirty and all those things. But you know, it's, it, when you look back, it's really not about working the cows. Even though we love to meet them later. <laughs> it's about being with them. You know, it's about sitting in a truck as we're driving up from one pasture to another. And just getting to talk. And to experience that relationship with my dad. That's what is so exciting about those times that we get to work cows together. It is just getting to just be with them. And here's a correlation to that. Sometimes we get so caught up in serving God that we forget to be with God. Sometimes we can get so caught up in working the cows that we forget to just take a minute and talk. Sometimes we can get so caught up in teaching a Sunday school class, teaching in a children's ministry, teaching in youth ministry, teaching in, in whatever. We can get so caught up in coming out here because tree limbs fell at the church. We can get so caught up in, in coming out here and, and cutting down tree limbs so that the, the property looks good for Sunday morning. Doing all these good things. We can get so caught up in doing those that we forget to just be with God and experience the relationship that he invites us into. If you've got a Bible, turn to Exodus chapter 3. And I want to encourage you, uh, if you, you know, if you've got it on your phone, pull your phone out. I want to encourage you, even after we read this, just to, to hold it out there and, and to keep it up so that as we go through the message this morning, you'll notice uh, on the bulletin it has the verses that kind of each point goes with. I want to encourage you as we read those and as we go back and I'm talking through those two different points. I want to encourage you to go back and, and scan back over the verses that are mentioned and listed there beside the points. But Exodus chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. 
There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone there to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask you, they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. We know this passage is very familiar to all of you. Moses has been exiled from Egypt. Uh, he, has, he has gone out and he's found a new home in the land of Midian. And he is working as a, basically he's a shepherd. He's leading his sheep out to find places for them to graze. And as he's doing that one day, he goes near the mountain called Horeb. And he sees a sight, an unusual sight. There's a bush that's on fire, but it's not burning up. Now I want to just tell you, it's interesting when you, when you go to commentaries and you start to study. I have some commentaries that, that I go to because sometimes I want to laugh. And uh, there's some very liberal style, uh, commentaries. And so sometimes I'll look at them and, and I just had to laugh when I read this, uh, what they would say about this passage. Because, you know, in those commentaries, they have, they cannot say God did a miracle. They want to explain everything away. And with this one, there were multiple commentaries that kept pointing out that in that area, there is this one particular type of bush that when it flowers... Uh, and when the berry, it has berries that come out, that when the sun is at a particular angle in the sky and, and the sun lands on these berries and flowers on this particular plant, that it looks as if it's burning. And so obviously that is what Moses saw. You know, I read that and, and I thought, you know, I got some problems with this. One, Moses is no dummy, right? Moses has been in Midian for a while. You know, he's been there long enough to marry into the priest of Midian's family. He, he's been there long enough that he has risen up within the family that now he's basically, the, you might say, the chief shepherd guarding the sheep. And so he's been in this area. Don't you think Moses knew about that plan? And don't you think that Moses could, was able to know that, yes, this trick of the sunlight happens and that from a distance it looks like it's burning? I think, yes, Moses was smart enough to know all that. Moses also knows what a fire really looks like. And he sees this. And, and Moses clearly says, there's a bush that is burning, but it does not burn up. Folks, that was God performing a miracle. It wasn't the trick of the sunlight hitting the leaves and the bush or the berries and the flowers and all of that. It was none of that. God performed a miracle. And so Moses goes and he draws close. His attention is drawn. But you know, the reality is God uses many things to grab our attention. It, God invites us to be on mission with Him. He uses things in our life, 
circumstances. We're going to be learning to experience God, that God speaks to us in a number of ways. But God uses all of these things around us to grab our attention. Sometimes He will use tra tragedies and crises to grab our attention. But then here's the reality. God wants to invite you to join Him on mission. And He will use whatever is necessary to get your attention. What we need to understand is this. It's an invitation. God invites us. He will not force us to join Him on mission. God will not, will not make you do anything. He gives you the freedom to choose. Even in this situation, Moses could have said no. And we'd have never heard anything else about Moses. But Moses understands that God is inviting him. That God is saying to him, I want you. And he recognizes that as an invitation. God invites us to join him on mission. He invites us to have a relationship with us. And in verses 4 through 6, God sets the parameters of that relationship. As Moses sees it, he's coming up and he's getting closer and closer until finally God speaks. And then he says, God says to him, stop. Take off your shoes because where you are standing is holy ground. The ground had not been holy previously. You know, this wasn't dirt that was any different than dirt anywhere else all around that area. It had become consecrated, it had become holy because God's presence was there in a very special way. And so he, God says to him, take off your shoes. Now you may wonder, why did he have to take his shoes off? Well, many ancient Near Eastern religions, when their priests would go into their temples, one of the things that they would do is they would remove their shoes. It is probably why when Muslims go into a mosque to worship, they remove their shoes. Now the thinking is that they have accumulated dust, secular, profane dust on their feet as they've gone about their life, and that they would drag that in. Now, I've always kind of wondered about that because, you know, you get dust not just on your shoes, especially if you're in a dusty area, it gets everywhere else. But it was really just, it was, it was a way for Moses to be, to be pointed out that this is special. You know, it was a way in having him take off his shoes. It was a way for God to say, Moses, you need to take an extra step here. It wasn't that he took his shoes off and now he didn't have any profane dust or dirt on him. He's a shepherd walking in a dusty area. He's got dust and dirt all over him. But it was just one sign from God. Take your shoes off because you are on holy ground. God sets the parameters. God says, this ground is holy because I am holy. And if you are going to have a relationship with me, you have to take some actions to cleanse yourself. You have to take some actions to remove the sin, the stain of sin from your life in order to have a relationship with me. Well, the reality is God does that even today. God is the one true God. He's shown that to so He's shown that to Moses in the burning bush. He's shown Moses that I am a God who can work miracles. And I want you to be in a relationship with me. I want you to know me. I want you to experience me in a very unique, a very special way. You and I still have to encounter God, approach God. On the basis of holiness. But isn't it a great news for us. That our holiness. Is not based on us. That our holiness. Is based on the life. The death. The burial. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That his holiness. Because he was willing to give his life for us. His holiness. When we accept that into our life. God's holiness comes upon us. And now you and I can approach God in a bold manner. Hebrews chapter 4 says that therefore let us approach the throne of grace with boldness. 
We can boldly approach God. Why? Not because I'm holy, but because God has made me holy. And for every one of us, we have to come to that place where we understand that our holiness is based on the righteousness of Christ given to us through participation in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We don't bring anything into the relationship. God sets the parameters. He set the parameters for Moses. This is what you have to do to be in relationship with me. He sets the parameters for us. This is what you have to do to be in relationship with me. And then once he has set the parameter, he begins to invite us to be on that mission. Verses 7 through 10. Having informed Moses of the parameters of the relationship, having basically told him who's in charge, you know, stop, don't go any further. God is saying, I'm the one in charge here. He now invites him to join on mission. God has seen the affliction of Israel. I love in those verses. The, the heart of God comes out. I've seen suffering. I've seen the pain. I've seen the heartache of my people Israel. And now I'm coming down to do something about it. This past, this weekend, many of you got to join me and some, a bunch of other people from Sanger over in the City of Commerce Friday night and Saturday night. Got to watch a special group of young ladies playing basketball. Our, lady, our ladies varsity team came one game short of going to the state tournament. Friday night, it was a blast. We won. Saturday night, we didn't win. We got outscored. And I want to tell you, one, those girls played hard, and we are very proud of them. And, and we ought to always be proud of them. But one thing that's, that really struck me after the game, we were kind of hanging out, waiting, you know, for the, for the girls to come back out. And, and they were all upset, which you can imagine, you can understand. And as they would come out, you know, different people would come up beside them and, you know, give them a hug and say, hey, y'all played great. You know, you had a great season. You're one of the, the top eight teams in Class 4A in the state of Texas. And folks, that's a huge accomplishment. And, you know, you could just tell it was like all these different people would say it. And, and it was as if the, the girls would hear it and go, okay, thank you, thank you. You know, I appreciate that. But then they'd get to dad. And you'd see the dad just grab their daughters up, wrap them up in their arms, and say whatever. I'm thinking they're saying, I love you. I am so proud of you. Man, y'all play so hard. And you could just see the girls at that point. It was like they were tough all the way through. But then dad would grab them. And you could just see them just kind of starting to boo. But it was in that moment that they were able to kind of let go of some of that pain. Why? Because they knew my daddy is here. My daddy is proud of me. My daddy loves me. And my daddy loves me no matter what. But I am secure because my daddy's got his arms around me. It's what in Moses, that's the message Moses is taking back to Israel. God is saying to Moses, tell Israel that their daddy is here. That their daddy has heard. That their daddy has seen their pain. That their daddy has seen their suffering. And now, Dad's coming to free you. The people of Israel are invited to join Moses in that incredible relationship with God. That idea when God says that I have seen the affliction of Israel, that is so much more than a disinterested observation. You know, it's not like God is watching the news and he sees a report on Israel's suffering and says, oh, that's too bad. Go to the next channel. God is watching. God's heart is breaking for his people. He recognizes what they have experienced. He recognizes what they are continuing to experience. And God says now is the time to act. And in choosing to act, God says, Moses, I want you to go for me. Moses, I am choosing you to go. Moses gets a personal invitation to join God on mission. 
Folks, you and I have the same personal invitation. God invites each and every one of us who are his followers. He invites us to be on mission with him. He invites us to be a part of what he is doing. God is at work in the city of Sanger. And he invites you and I to be a part of that. Our problem is we get so distracted that we're not able to hear when God is calling us. One of the tenets of experiencing God in this study is God is at work all around us. Folks, God is already at work. He is already doing amazing things. Your job and my job is to find out where he's working and then to hear his invitation to say, come join me. You know, this past week I've seen a bunch of stuff on on uh, Facebook talking about that, that we have said to God, you're no longer welcome in our schools. I told you all last week, the reality is God is welcome in our schools. God is there. He is there every time one of our students or one of our teachers that are believers, that are followers of Jesus Christ, every time one of them walks into that school, God is with them. God is still in the schools. They have Bible studies in our school. God is there. God is working. Many of our students have, have experienced God working in school, and they are saying, we want to be on mission with God. All around us, God is working. You and I have to get to the place where we can see Him working, see what He's doing, and join Him on mission. And in verses 11 through 14, God gives one of the greatest promises ever. He gives a promise of his presence. You know, Moses recognized his own situation. Moses recognized that, that he had to flee from Egypt. He's been exiled out of Egypt. He recognizes that from a human perspective, to go back to Egypt is basically a death sentence. And so he is saying to, to God, listen, this isn't going to work. Sending me is not a good idea, God. He says... Even the Jews themselves have rejected me. God, you're, you're calling the wrong person. How can I possibly go back and lead Israel out of Egypt? When Moses sees no possible way forward, God intervenes. And he tells Moses exactly who it is that is sending him. <coughs> As Moses said, Moses trying every excuse in the book. And he says, oh, I've got one, God. If I go back to Egypt, who do I say sent me? And you know, God could have come up with a lot of names. God could have, could have you know, put ten compound words together and had a, had a name that took pages and pages to write. But I love it. God says, I am. Tell them that I am has sent you. You know, I've always wondered, what exactly does that mean? That is such a simple phrase, I am. Another way to translate it would be to say, I am who I am, I am that I am. As I, as I thought about it, you know, I thought the, the, the way that you can break that down to maybe the clearest understanding is God is saying, the God who has no first cause, the God whose existence is not predicated on anything else, is the one who calls, calls you. God is saying, I am the first cause. Philosophers of religion will, will talk about uh, uh, the beginning of the world, and you know they'll, they'll try to look back and they try to say, what was the first thing? Well, I'll tell you what the first thing was. The first cause of everything was the God who says, I am. Folks, that means that God's existence, God's power, God's presence, it is not, it is a, nothing else can remove it. There is nothing that you can say that caused God's presence. God exists. Simply because he exists. The God who has the power.
to exist simply because he exists. The God who has the power to bring everything else into existence is the God who wants you to know him. He is the God who wants you to be on mission with him. The most powerful being in all of history. The most powerful being that could ever be imagined invites you and me to join him on mission. Folks, that is incredible to me. This God who nothing can stop. This God who knows the, the, all the birds of the, of the air, the fish of the sea, and he is concerned about them. That same God wants to know me and wants to be known by me. God is inviting you into a relationship with him. He is saying to you, I want you. And when we get in relationship with him, we get to enjoy the benefits of that relationship. But we also need to understand that as we really get in relationship with God, that he is going to call us. That he is going to place us in service in his kingdom. So my question for you is, number one, do you have that relationship with God? Do you have a relationship with a God that is an unstoppable force? A God whom nothing can stop? If you don't have that relationship, don't leave here today before you take care of it. Bring your life into a relationship with Him. And for those of us that would answer that question and say, yes, I am, I, I, I know God and I am known by God. And my question for you is this. Where is He placing you on mission? Because folks, God does not save us to stick us in a corner. God saves us to put us to work. He wants to put you to work. And if you really want to know God, start serving Him. Because it is as we work alongside God, doing what God has called us to do, that we learn even more about who He is. God is calling you into a relationship with Him. And He's calling you to serve with Him. And that's my challenge for you today. If you've never come to that place where you have developed a relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ the Son, then in just a minute we're going to be singing. And I invite you to come and talk with me about how to take that first step, how to, how to come into a relationship with God. If you would say, yes, I'm in a relationship with God, but man, I, I, just, I just don't know what He wants me to do. I, I don't know what He's calling me to do. And man, I want to just I want to capture, challenge you. As we sing, come pray. Ask God to, to show you where he's working. To show you where he's calling you to serve. Let's be on a mission for God. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you today. Father, I thank you for the fact that you want to be in relationship with us. <coughs> Father, I also thank you for the incredible privilege of working alongside you. It's in your Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, if you are not a part of a local body,